Hey, and welcome to The Short Stuff. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and this is Short Stuff, so let's get going. And Chuck, I have to say, if I'm grateful for one thing to not have one thing, it's an infant right now. Because I can't imagine the stress of having an infant right now here in the United States. Yeah, if you have an infant right now and you are not able to breastfeed for one reason or another, it probably is stressful because there's an infant formula, baby formula, shortage, as everyone knows. Uh, we got to thank our old uh, colleagues at How Stuff Works and Alicia Hoyt Mm -hmm. for this very timely article. But uh, I was thinking the other day, I was like, well, what did they used to do? Because baby formula is pretty new. Yeah. And not and you know, mothers have not you know it's not like not being able to breastfeed is a new thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, there have always been conditions uh, that could lead to that, or you know some some people just don't want to breastfeed, mm-hmm. uh, or like in our case, you adopt a kid, you don't have the option of breastfeeding. Mm-hmm. So what did they used to do? And I guess the first thing we should talk about is wet nurses. Yeah, because that's the obvious idea. I mean, wet nurses go back for like 4,000 years at least um, where women were hired or if they were enslaved, um, they would be forced to nurse babies. Usually it was associated with the elite though, right? Yeah, and I did some more research on this and there's even a book about the exploitive nature and the history of uh, wet nursing Mm -hmm. uh, because it seems like lesser and lesser it wasn't just like oh it's just a job you can have and more it's like well i've got a lot of money i'm not interested so you do it or you're an enslaved person Mm -hmm. so we're going to take advantage of you by forcing you to do so um it seems like it's got a pretty exploitive ugly past but it still happens there are technically there are still wet nurses you can hire but it seems like from what i research the sharing of breast milk these days is way more casual among friends and family like hey uh this mom is busy working so their mom friends might chip in and help Mm -hmm. and pump and dump and you can here's my breast milk you can have it for this week you're really busy um it it seems to be more of breast pumping although there is you know there are still friends and family that are comfortable with saying like no you can just breastfeed my child that's great it's natural it's lovely and beautiful right it's not exploitive in that sense at all Right. Like things really changed post-Civil War, it seems like, with the wet nursing. So, um, yeah, and we talked also about milk banks where, like, you might have – you might feed your baby milk from another uh, person who um, you might never meet who just donates her extra milk because she can and wants to. Uh, We talked about that in our – either a breastfeeding or bottle feeding episode. Remember that two-parter that we did? Yeah. Those were good. Those were real good. Yeah. I think they still stand up, too. So if you want to know more about infant formula, go check that out. Or breastfeeding, go check the other one out. But so if you didn't have access to a wet nurse, Chuck, what did you do, hot shot? What did you do? Milk a donkey. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Hold still, donkey. Uh, I joke, but that's actually true. They, um, you know, obviously animal milk is something that we drink. Uh, some people do at least. I like cow's milk. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they would give kids cow's milk. But in other places, depending what animals you had around, could be a donkey or a goat or a horse or something. Yeah. Sheep, pigs. and uh, Any mammal makes milk, even Robert De Niro. You could milk me, Greg. <laughs> That's right. So that makes sense. I mean, yeah, milk from another animal, it's probably a pretty good alternative, especially if milk from humans is unavailable for one reason or another. But they also um, came up with other methods, I guess starting in the 16th to 18th century, um, where they would create something called pap. And it was basically like um, milk toast or yeah. cereal, wet cereal with, with water. And they would feed it to a baby um, using a special device called a pap boat, which, if you look it up, it's a gravy boat. They would use a gravy boat to feed an infant milk toast. Right. They would clean the gravy out, <laughs> right. put the pap in, mm-hmm. and it would be a pap boat. Right. There you go. The problem here, though, is is this was uh, before they knew about sterilization and things like that. And so that was the big problem. It wasn't as much of the nutrients that the baby was getting, although that was a factor. But as far as infant mortality and uh, kids growing up with uh, deficiencies, uh, most times it was because, I think, of the fact that these pat boats weren't very sterile that they were shoving in the kid's mouth. 
Yeah, it was like the Stuff You Should Know TV show's craft services table. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, I I finally sat uh, my daughter down. We watched one of those the other day. Oh, yeah. What'd she think? Uh, she was like, I mean, she kind of gets that I do a job where people know who I am and then mm-hmm. I've been on TV and stuff. But I think when she actually saw it and saw us, she was a little knocked out. I think she thought it was pretty cool. Was she like, wow, Josh is really wearing a lot of makeup? <laughs> no, I said that. <laughs> <laughs> right. She's like, oh, no, I see. I see. Exactly. It. Couldn't miss it, Dad. Uh, so the first infant formula, or should we take a break? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, let's take a break. All right. Then we'll talk about the first infant formula. No, wait. Yeah. Okay. We'll be right back. Okay. The fir- Are you still humming? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. The first infant formula attempt, uh, as far as like, hey, let's try and uh, duplicate human breast milk, mm-hmm. was in 1865 and a gentleman named Justus von Liebig. And that is uh, the first baby formula. It was cow's milk. It was malt flour, uh, wheat, and potassium bicarbonate. Mm-hmm. And then I think, uh, when was that? 1865. A couple of years later, Another pharmacist named Henri, uh, is it Nestle or Nestle? Nestle. That's the Nestle guy. I figured, but is it pronounced Nestle in French? I think so. All right. Uh, uh, They launched the, uh, well, why don't you say it, Mr. Frenchy? (laughs) Farine Lacte Nestle. And it means plain flour milky Nestle. (laughs) Yeah. And it was was the same thing, basically, but it was just easier to uh, mix together and get out the door. And then I think... Only like 15 years later or so, there were up to close to 30 brands of infant food on the mm-hmm. shelves. Yeah, because Von Liebig really kicked something off. And also, we got to hat tip that guy a little more. He also gave us beef bouillon cubes mm. and um, synthetic fertilizers, among Ooh. many, many other things. So he definitely changed the world quite a bit. Interesting. Uh, the 1950s, I think is when things really came around as far as formula. Like Mm -hmm. before that in the 30s and 40s, they would recommend like evaporated milk or something once they figured uh, safely canning things. Mm -hmm. But in the early 1950s is when the first uh, liquid formula was invented that you didn't have to mix up. Yeah. And a lot of people just, a lot of mothers were just like, all right, I'd rather use this than breastfeed. And then I think in the 70s and 80s, uh, it came back around a little more to mothers wanting to breastfeed more. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And as Alicia Hoyt points out, we now live in a time, thankfully, where there's um, at least shouldn't be any judgment either way on how people want to feed their babies. Yeah, because I think you can trace that to um, different waves of feminism as well. Like yeah. that, that formula freed women in a lot of ways from being shackled to the household necessarily like sorry you got to raise the kid or else it's going to starve no it's like no here dad here's some formula even you can do this even you can do this without screwing it up roger (laughs) and then it's it's like and then as feminism kind of took different forms and it was like hey let's stop being judgy or let's stop forcing women to find you know to all follow one direction as as feminists it kind of came back around and then finally we reached this kind of non-judgmental state and by the way, we need to do a, an episode on feminism once and for all. Yeah, that would probably be at least a two-parter because of the, all the different waves of feminism, I would yeah, think. Yeah, for sure. Maybe one per wave? Oh, boy, that'd be a lot. That's <laughs> that like a mini-series. All right, well, we'll see. Um, but we should talk about whether or not, because, you know, obviously with the shortage right now, there are probably uh, desperate mothers out there, especially in, in lower-income brackets, that are thinking, could I, should I make my own infant formula? And sort of generally experts say that's not a good idea for a lot of reasons. Well, yeah. I mean, infant formula today is heavily regulated. Um, There was an act called the Infant Formula Act of 1980, which is described as one of the most specific and detailed acts ever passed by Congress that sets a lot of standards for 
maximum levels of nutrients, minimum levels of nutrients, um, you know, what constitutes adulteration, what, um, what, uh, how a recall follows. It's really specific to, like, make sure that formula is as safe as it gets. And so it's really heavily formulated. It's technically an ultra-processed food. It'd be a group four food, by the way. But it's, like, really scientifically calibrated, and you just can't do that at home with homemade ingredients. Right. I'm sure there are recipes uh, that probably include things like cow's milk, uh, generally— and rose quartz crystals. <laughs> generally vegetable oil, uh, lactose. But th- like you said, there are uh, just a whole host of uh, m- nutrients that they have settled on as like, hey, we know how to make baby formula. So, Because I think in the old days, like the stuff they were doing, it would it would plump a baby up just fine— but they were not getting the nutrients they needed. And it's it's like right. back then it was like, oh, you got a big, round, chubby, healthy baby. Uh, <laughs> With and that dark wasn't... circles <laughs> under his eyes. Yeah, and that wasn't always the case. So now they've really, um, thankfully, honed it down to something that they say you shouldn't replicate at home. And I don't think this is a case where it's just like big formula s- squashing right. the the idea that you could do this yourself. It seems like a genuine safety issue. Yes, and I should point out that we have enough self-perspective that we realize we've done a complete 180 about face on ultra-processed foods and made-at-home foods in this episode. Oh, yeah, sure. Compared to our ultra-processed foods episode. That's a good point. It is a good point. And if that one hasn't come out yet, you have it to look forward to. Yeah, exactly. You'll, you'll understand a lot better when that episode comes out. That's right. You got anything else? I got nothing else. They say don't do it. Uh, I really just, my heart goes out to anyone out there that's stressed out about trying to find formula, and hopefully that can be corrected soon. Yeah, that has to be like a deep, profound, very unique form of stress. I can't imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So hang in there, everybody. Uh, If you have a story about that, especially if you have tips or techniques that are proven and scientifically based, maybe send them in and we'll try to share them with everybody. How about that? Agreed. Okay. Uh, Well, since Chuck said agreed, everybody, short stuff is out. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.